So here we are in the third installment. This may take several. Well, let's consider those five agents of evolutionary change like I said we would. We'll begin with mutation. Typical mutation rates are too low to have too much of an effect on Hardy-Weinberg proportions of most alleles. In fact, there's only usually about one mutation in a gene per 1,000 divisions of that gene, so it's pretty low. That means that other evolutionary forces need to play a larger role in changing the allele frequencies. Still, mutation is the ultimate source of genetic variation. Without it, there's no evolution. So just remember that. But remember that mutations are not ran or excuse me, they are random and will not happen more often just because they would help us in a certain environment. That would be planned. For example, our cool beaver here. Love that. Next, let's take a look at gene flow. Gene flow is just the movement of alleles from one population to another. Now, how does this happen? One way that this can happen is through migration. Immigrating individuals, if they're well enough suited to their new environment, they can add some of their alleles to the population's existing gene pool. You can get drifting of gametes or youngins. Babies will be on the move. For example, pollinating animals can carry pollen or gametes great distances. Seeds can blow in the wind or could be carried by animals in fur or digestive systems. Or you could get mating between two adjacent but different populations. So just remember that gene flow basically happens when a population gains or loses alleles by genetic additions and or subtractions from the population. But see, what gene flow does is it homogenizes allele frequencies among the populations. For example, if population A has P of 0.2 and Q of 0.8 and the reverse in population 2, if they come into contact with one another, gene flow would just bring the rarer allele into each population over time until both P and Q are 0.5, or in other words, equal. And then that population would be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. The next agent of change would be non-random mating. Let's bring that picture down here where it makes more sense. Or not. Where did my picture go? There, now we can look at it. Non-random mating. Non-random mating is basically choosing your mate or mate selection. There are two types. There's assortative mating and dissortative mating. Assortative mating means that individuals choose to mate with those that are phenotypically similar. Now, obviously, this would cause certain genotypic frequencies to vary from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. This does not change allele frequencies, it just changes the proportion of homozygous individuals. So that would make maybe more of the population be homozygous, but it doesn't change the actual frequencies. Two individuals that are phenotypically similar are most likely genotypically similar too. Their offspring just have two copies of the same allele. For example, self-fertilizing plants, which is what this picture is all about, are largely homozygous because they're, well, self-fertilizing. Hopefully that makes sense. Dissortative mating is where phenotypically different individuals mate, and this would actually increase up to a higher proportion of heterozygotes. That hopefully makes sense as well. Pretty simple. The fourth agent of change is genetic drift. Genetic drift is where you have a change in allele frequencies due to chance, and this is going to result in unpredictable fluctuations over time. And this has a very amplified effect in small populations. This is why populations must be exceptionally large to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. For example, if only a few individuals gave rise to the next generation, the subsequent generation's alleles, allele frequencies may not actually represent the population from which their parents came, even if the forces of natural selection are the same. This can increase the frequency of deleterious alleles and decrease the frequency of advantageous alleles and can actually result in the loss of alleles in isolated populations. And it usually works with foundry effects and bottleneck effects. And this is an image of the, the bottleneck effect that you might remember seeing from biology. But we'll get back to that one. I'd like to start with the foundry effect. But as I'm typing, it changes where my great pictures are. 
So the founder effect, this guy right here, muy importante. It's the effect by which rare alleles and combinations of alleles may be enhanced in new populations when a few pioneers, if you will, establish new populations. Another way of saying it is that the gene pool of founding population is not reflective of the source population. This occurs commonly in self-fertilizing plants when a single seed begins a new population. We also see it, um, it's common on distant oceanic islands like Hawaii or the Galapagos. The organisms on these islands were probably pioneers or founders. And to you, in this example, it's kind of interesting where if in a population of Drosophila, there are very few white-eyed males and he mates one mate of these mates with a black-eyed female, and they're, the female is blown by a storm over to another island, then you see a higher proportion of white eye than we did in the previous population. Now to use a human example of the founder effect, very, very interesting. This is usually dominated by genetic features that represent their founders, the Amish. The Amish population in the US have a very high frequency of several conditions conditions including polydactylism. And I realize that these show up a little bit fuzzy for you, so I'm gonna read this, it's very interesting. This is a picture of a, an Amish mother holding her child who has Ellis, Ellis Van Preveld syndrome. And not only does the child have polydactyly, but they have shorter limbs and other problems that are assorted, um, associated with inbreeding. And all of the Amish that have this syndrome are descendants of a single couple that helped to found the Amish community in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania in 1744. And because that community really kept to itself very isolated, there was a good deal of inbreeding. And so this recessive trait is actually quite common, unfortunately. So here's the bottleneck effect. The bottleneck effect has to do with this parent population that has a blend of phenotypes and genotypes but due to some drastic population reduction event, maybe a natural disaster, only a few survive. And perhaps those that survive don't necessarily reflect the total population that they came from. Therefore, the future generations would look like these, these individuals that survived rather than the parent generation. So this would cause genetic drift that would result from a sudden decrease in a population due to environmental factors. Bottleneck usually is due to natural forces like flooding, drought, an epidemic disease, or from progressive changes in the environment. The surviving individuals are usually a random selection of original population unless their genotype actually played a role in their survival. And this is going to result in alternations to the genetic makeup of the population, including decreases in genetic variability. A real example of that are the lions of Ngoro Ngoro, let me see if I can move my picture so we can see it a little bit better. All kinds of crazy stuff happening here. Sorry, I didn't realize that had happened. Otherwise, I would have fixed it. So the lions in Ngoro Ngoro, they have a very high frequency of sperm abnormality. And if you take a look at this graph, you can see that back before 1960 or, or around there, they had a, an okay population size, not particularly high, but there is an obvious crash in their population size. And then as they have recovered since then, even though their numbers have gone up, we know that the level of hydrozygosity has actually gone down quite a bit. This is also true of California condors, whose population was reduced to about a size of eight or nine animals. The northern elephant seal along the west coast of North America and its islands were hunted almost to extinction in the 1800s until only one population of about 20 animals existed. And now down in Baja, California. But of course, that population was probably different than the populations up north. Now the population in, is in the tens of thousands, but it's lost nearly all of its genetic diversity. So bottleneck does do reduce the genetic diversity when it occurs for long periods of time, not just in one big bang. And that's where this other picture comes in, where it just shows you how quickly genetic change can happen, but how it can also bounce around. Where if you had 
and this population, this is representing a bottle, you know, maybe one out of this large number of flies, a very low frequency of the allele for the green eye, and then in the next generation, because this one happened to survive, um, you have more, but then another bottleneck effect, and none of the green-eyed flies survive, therefore the next generation would not have green eyes either. And our last agent of change is selection. Now what we're talking about here is natural selection. This causes a big change in allele frequency. This is the process by which some organisms leave more offspring than competing ones, and their genetic traits appear in greater proportions among members of succeeding generations than the traits of those individuals that leave fewer offspring. So there are two types of natural selection or selection. There's artificial selection and natural selection. So let's take a look first at artificial selection. Artificial selection is represented by this picture here, where breeders will select for desired traits and cause changes, for example, corn from historic maize plant. Natural selection is an environmental condition that determines which individuals in a population produce the most offspring. It's going to require these things. It's going to require that there is, first of all, variation among the individuals and that the variation has to result in differences in the number of offspring in the next generation that survive and the variation must be genetically inherited. Okay, so first there's got to be variation in the individuals which has to result in differences in the number of offspring that they're, they make and that variation has to be genetically based. Remember that natural selection is the process by which evolution occurs, right? Uh, the evolution is the product, natural selection is the process. Let's look at some examples to show us some ideas about how natural selection works. And there are three ways that we can see natural selection. One is the selection to avoid predators. Here, what we have is the sulfur butterfly's caterpillar larvae. You see the green camouflage, which of course, you know, would not be as easily detected as would be the blue counterpart. This is a diagram from that book, but the blue ones do exist and of course they're picked off by predators more readily because they can see them. Another example is a land snail. The shell markings will match the background that it inhabits, another form of camouflage. Another example that I really enjoy are many rodents in the American Southwest. In this area, it's a site of ancient lava flows where you get this black rock formation all along or within the very pale desert sand. And pocket mice, I suppose because they could fit in your pocket, come in two color variations. You've got the light colored pocket mice, which of course blend in very nicely with the, the sandy environment, and then you have these dark or black pocket mice that do better on the lava or the rock formations. So pretty much you're going to try to stick to the background that fits your color because predators are really good at seeing you if you don't match your background. Now another way that we see organisms going through selection is selection to match climatic conditions. This is kind of interesting. When we look at analyses of enzyme encoding genes, it's often revealed a pattern of allele frequency that vary latitudinally. Now, when we're talking about latitude, we're talking about temperature, right? The farther north you go in latitude, the colder it gets. When we look at fish called the mummy chog, that's fun to say, which are on, along the east coast of North America, they have an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase, which is responsible for converting pyruvate to lactate. And of course, that's going to be part of their cellular, respirator, cellular respiration um, and basically just helping them get energy. Remember the spit lab and temperatures and how that can affect enzymes and how well they work? Well, the, their enzymes work differently at different temperatures. The form of the enzyme that's found most often in the fish from the north works most efficiently at cold temperatures. That's probably not surprising. 
At low temperatures, those individuals with the northern allele swim faster and survive better than those with the southern allele. That's because they have a better conversion rate of pyruvate to lactate, therefore they're getting more energy. And this graph just elucidates that right here. And the last here is the selection for pesticide resistance, another example. When we consider this idea of pesticide resistance in insects, which has come from our overuse of pesticides, it's led to the rapid evolution of many insect species, over 500 of them. For example, the common housefly has just three or so alleles that can improve its resistance. For example, an allele at the pen gene will decrease the fly taking up pesticide into its body. The alleles KDR and DLDR genes decrease the number of target sites for the pesticide to actually work. And then other alleles will bolster the ability of the fly's enzymes to identify and detoxify insecticides. Pretty scary. But we see three good examples of selection. And lastly, what we'll take a look at before we take another break is how do we measure fitness? Now, fitness is the number of surviving offspring left in the, gener the next generation. I'm going to make this a little fancier for you and ask you to write this down as well. A little fuller definition. So relative fitness is really the contribution an organism makes to the gene pool of the next generation relative to other members' contributions. So relative fitness is a better term to use than just fitness because you're talking about how successful an organism is compared to everyone else in its cohort group. And this is simply a way to quantify reproductive success. Now remember that natural selection acts directly on the phenotype but indirectly on the genotype, right? So the most fit phenotype would be assigned a fitness value of a one, while the others would be expressed as relative proportions of that one. For example, green toads leave four offspring, but brown toads leave two and a half offspring. Who would you rather be? Probably the green toad. So the green phenotype fitness would be 1.0. And then comparatively, in order to figure out the brown phenotype fitness, you simply take a proportion of that. Two and a half divided by four it gives you 0.625. Therefore, the brown phenotype has a greater fitness level than the brown phenotype. So if color is genetically based, evolutionary change should occur, increasing the frequency of the green toads while decreasing the frequency of the brown alleles until they totally disappear. And we're almost finished with this section. So what are the components of fitness then? So fitness, I'm going to highlight all this. This is all good. Fitness is a combination of survival, mating success, and number of offspring per mating. It's not just how long you survive, but how successful you are at reproducing as well. And sometimes trait selection is a double-edged sword. A phenotype may be advantageous for one aspect of fitness, but disadvantageous for another. And here's a great example of that, water striders. And these are three graphs that if you were to overlay them, they would really show you the principle that we've understood here. Large females, which is shown here in terms of the body size, the large females lay, where am I? lay the most number of eggs per day, sorry, this is the body length in the, the females, they lay the most number of eggs per day, but they don't live very long. You see that? The smaller water striders, they may lay a lot of eggs in a day, egg, sorry, they may live a long time, but they don't lay very many eggs. So, who is best off? The intermediate, slightly longer, water strider females. They may have an intermediate lifespan, maybe they don't live as long as the small ones, but they lay a decent number of eggs per
per day. So all in all, maybe it's better to be intermediate sized. So in the end, the take home of this section is that an organism's reproductive success is affected by how long it survives, how often it mates, and how many offspring it produces per mating.